afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining our live virtual event with middle grade author Kier Graf to hear more about his newest novel, The Tiny Mansion. I'm your host, Jessica, the event coordinator here at Country Bookshelf. And we're grateful to be here in this virtual space with, space with our fellow Books in Common Northwest stores, Helena Springs Books in Sisters, Oregon, and Madison Books in Seattle, Washington. Visit booksincommonnw.com for more information and be sure to follow us on Eventbrite to register for more great Books in Common events. Before we get to Kier, I just wanted to point out a couple things about this virtual space. Um, there is a link to purchase your copy of The Tiny Mansion if you haven't already done so when you registered. Um, just click on the link of your favorite sponsoring store and we'll get that out to you. Um, if you have any questions for Kier, uh, you are welcome to use the raise your hand function there beneath your participant bar, um, or you can just drop it in the chat like I did the link to purchase your copy. Um, if you run into any tech issues along the way, we recommend you first try exiting and re-entering the meeting. If you can't get back in, uh, we hope you'll visit the Books in Common website to find more information and um, we may be able to hook you up with a private screening um, at the after we conclude today. We do want to remind everyone that this is a shared creative space that we want to remain safe for everyone who's joined us today. We ask that you be respectful of everyone, offensive and inappropriate comments or questions will see the user dismissed from the space. As I mentioned before, Kier Graf is joining us this afternoon. He's the author of funny and fantastical middle grade adventure novels, including The Phantom Tower, named a best children's book of 2018 by the Chicago Tribune, and The Matchstick Castle, an official Illinois Reads 2018 selection. He also writes books for grownups, grown some of them under fake names. A longtime resident of Chicago, he lives near the shore of Lake Michigan with his wife, Maria, sons Felix and Cosmo, and cats Toothless and Totoro, who I'm informed will not be making a cameo appearance this afternoon. Um, I feel so, very badly about that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, that's this, everyone's favorite thing about Zoom, I think, is the pets that, that choose to make an appearance. But Kier, thank you so much for joining us. We're absolutely delighted to have you here to share the tiny mansion. Um, this feels very in keeping kind of, I think, with how the folks in the tiny mansion might, might uh, visit their friends and family. So yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah it's funny, like I, I wrote this book, um, you know, I feel like two things have come true with this book. Like one, I mean, it, uh, the cl it climaxes with a, a terrible uh, wildfire, which of course, sadly, uh, fire is becoming much more of an annual occurrence in, in different parts of the country. So maybe not so surprising, but it has been a particularly bad fire year in, in Northern California where the book is set. But the thing that I could not have anticipated at all was COVID uh, and people feeling like they are all stuck living in tiny, <laughs> tiny houses. I often describe our household as being like, you know, living in a submarine together, you know, it feels like we're, we've been out at sea now for however many months since April, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, did you, have you ever lived in a tiny home like this here on, it's behind you too, much better. <laughs> <but>. Yes. <laughs> I live in this one. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, but I'm just fascinated with little houses. I, the, um, I think there's something, you know, like, I think, you know, years ago I would see pictures and articles about like, you know, super efficient uh, apartments in Japan, you know, how people would like, a family of four would live in, you know, 625 square feet or something. You just go, oh my gosh, how do they do it? And um, I, it's fascinating to me in part, partly just because of the kind of like puzzle box, box aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And partly because I think that, you know, it's a great um, kind of response to McMansions. And like, I think that there are far too many people who have more space than they need. You know, people buy houses with rooms that they can't even fill. And it's really probably not the best thing for the planet for people to do that. And so um, I, I love that the tiny house movement feels like kind of a, a response to that. Um, and I more and more, I've been thinking about a tiny house and, you know, I love to you know, watch videos on YouTube of like, you know, how people live in their tiny house or how they, they made it. And um, you know, particularly on a writer's, you know, income, I think that that might be the appropriate vacation home in my future. 
So I, I keep thinking about like, where's a little, little spot of land where I can put a little tiny house. Would you want to put it in North Carolina or North Carolina, Northern California, where the book is set? Or would you pick someplace you've never lived before? I would pick somewhere else. I mean, Northern California is just gorgeous when it's not on fire. However, um, it's, it, to me, it really has to be someplace that I have access to. Now, I'm very fortunate that you know, born and raised in Montana, I still got family there and I, and I get out there you know, as often as possible, uh, a lot more than, than I, in previous years than this year. But to me, it would have to be somewhere, you know, somewhere I could get to when I just need an escape from the city. I live right, right in the middle of Chicago and um, the biggest, you know, I've been here for years and years now, but I, I still struggle with the kind of lack of easy access to trailheads and things like that that I used to enjoy. So I would, I would want to find a, you know, a little thicket on a creek somewhere you know, within two hours drive of, of where I live. So I could just get there for the weekend and sit outside and read a book. That, that would be my ideal weekend at my tiny house. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that would be the ideal weekend for a lot of us right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much how, I, you know, it's, it's like the uh, busman's holiday. That's how I spend my vacations anyway. Is like, you know, I take like eight books for seven days and then, you know, sit in a lawn chair in the shade of a tree for, you know, until my muscles stiffen up. But that's, that's kind of heaven for me. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm daydreaming. <laughs> um, so you've kind of mentioned the, the wildfire that is one of the main sort of inciting events in the tiny mansion. Um, I'm curious if you've ever, if your home has ever been threatened by a wildfire when you were growing up in Montana or places elsewhere, or what kind of research you did about wildfires and how people are affected by them? Yeah, well, uh, I was fortunately never uh, personally affected by a, a forest fire growing up. Um, and in fact, you know, I mean, it's, it's changed so much because when I was growing up, it really was an event when, when there was a significant forest fire around us. And I do remember them. I mean, I remember uh, one time my family was uh, you know, we went to Glacier Park pretty often. And, and one time there was a very, there was a major fire there and we, and it was still burning and smoldering and they, they were letting us drive through. And so we were, you know, gosh, a hundred yards away from like burning trees. And that, that really, really left uh, a strong impression on me as a kid. And I'm sure that that's part of what drew me back to it, you know, for this, um, you know, and then in, in recent years, it seemed like my summer visits home would, you know, it, more often than not, we would, the, the sky would be filled with smoke and there'd be fires here, there'd be fires there. You know, it's just, uh, it's just become, you know, due to climate change, it's just become an, an ongoing undeniable fact. And, and it's certainly something that distresses me. And, and a lot of times, you know, even in my kids' books, I'm trying to write about things that kind of bother me, but in a way that's like, you know, appropriate for younger readers. Um, and, you know, younger readers can, they're very sophisticated. They can tackle some big topics. Uh, I don't write about wildfire in this book as so much of a, you know, an ecological concern, but more of a fact of life for somebody who's, uh, you know, who's in that area at that time. Sure. And um, yeah, as far as research, you know, I, moderate amount of research. Um, so, some, some stuff I already knew. Um, so, some of it is just like, you know, I, I'm a voracious news reader, so some of it is just, you know, like following yeah. fires in Northern California. I just felt like I, I absorbed stories and, and anecdotes and things about it, and some of that works its way in. But as a writer, I, I'm always envious of writers who do heavy, heavy research. Um, I would love to do more research because I enjoy it, but I often am so busy because I do multiple books a year that I can't do as much research as I like, but at the same time, I feel like my job, since I write fiction, not nonfiction, my job is to do just enough research that I don't screw it up, you know, just enough research to make it believable for the reader and not get any facts wrong. Um, but I, my hat's off to people who burrow down and, and, you know, spend a year researching before they even start writing. That seems pretty cool. Yeah. Um... I feel like I definitely would have used that opportunity to be like, mm, I better see if there's a tiny house on Airbnb or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's research. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, and I totally should have, but at the same time, what I was doing is in terms of that is, you know, just, you know, I have kids. I know how they, I know how they, you know, behave in a 
motel room after 48 hours uh, of you know, staying somewhere. Um, and so you just kind of extrapolate. And then I used all the visuals from all the, the tiny houses I've been you know, creeping on uh, <laughs> to, to kind of fill in the blanks. How did Dagmar come to you? It, is she an amalgamation of a lot of those characteristics that you observed in your children or um, nieces, nephews? I also am just really curious uh, where you came up with the name Dagmar. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll answer that part first. Um, Dagmar was a shortlist girl's name for my wife and I, if, if we were going to have a, a, a girl and we didn't, um, you know, that's funny. My green screen is this, the sun is coming through the window behind my green screen, which is creating an amazing effect here. <laughs> <laughs> Sunspots. Uh, so that was a shortlist name for us. We, we have two boys. We didn't know what the gender was going to be for either one of them. And uh, so we had shortlist names for girls and for boys and Dagmar was one we just loved. It felt like this kind of glamorous old movie star name or something from the thirties or I don't know. Um, we just really liked it. And, you know, and I believe in Europe it'd be pronounced Dogmar, but I, I think for American audiences, nobody would look at it and say it that way. Um, so we just liked that name and I find naming characters very difficult. So if I have a name I like, I, I hang on to it. <laughs> Um, and as far as her personality, you know, my, my first, well, yeah. So th th there's kind of a loose, it's not a tr trilogy in any way, but like this, my most recent three middle grade books are, are grouped by this kind of like wacky architecture theme, right? Adventures in strange and unusual homes. And the Matchstick Castle was a super male book, like, and it was really intentionally so. A, a middle grade librarian, a friend of mine had said she was just, struggling to find books to hook boy readers. And as the parent of what were then much younger boys, uh, that just really troubled me. I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, this is, that's terrible. And so I started thinking, um, and that was my second middle grade novel. And I started thinking about like this kind of eccentric, wacky Marx Brothers kind of world um, that, and in two families that are really run by these, by patriarchs in a way, and they're very different. One of them is very, overly strict and unpleasant. And one of them is just totally daffy and out of it. And the, the, the men who run these households aren't particularly great at it. They don't make a lot of great decisions. In fact, the women in the story, the, the, the several women in the story are much more grounded. But I wrote that very intentionally to be kind of a boy book. Um, on, and uh, right away, I got this letter from, from a mom saying, <laughs> kind of calling me out on that and saying, you know, you need to write books for girls too. And I kind of told her my whole story and, and how I was, you know, trying to respond to what I thought was a need. And, and my next book was a little more blended. It was still a kind of boy protagonist, but they have a, a super smart um, friend who, who joins the team. And then this one, I just thought, yeah, it's time to have an adventurous girl heroine um, take the lead. And um, I was actually, it's funny that the inspiration for Dagmar was, it's hard to put my finger on it, but as far as the middle grade characters I've written, she was really, and she's my favorite. I mean, she just leapt off the page. I've never had, I'm not one of those writers who says, oh, my characters come alive and talk to me. I just, I wish, but they don't. Um, but at the same time, I felt like I understood her, wrote her and I, and her voice, while she didn't talk to me, while I was writing her, I could hear her voice very clearly. Um, and I think it's because she's the, the strongest middle grade character I've written. And, and that just helped. It just, she was very opinionated on things. She had a plan. She stuck in this little house with her family for the summer. She does not want to be there. She formulates a plan to get the heck out of there. And it's a misguided plan, but she is fully committed and starts to put it into effect with some, you know, results she doesn't necessarily anticipate. Um, and in some ways I was drawing on a little bit my own childhood, which was, I mean, the very first page of the book, she's trespassing. And I grew up in a time and place when, <laughs> you know, 1970s Montana, where uh, we, you know, I mean, you, re you respect the fences, you got to respect, but we definitely did a lot of exploring. And when I got a little older, I was often finding myself in places that I wasn't necessarily supposed to be, but that was just, I was always curious what was on the other side of whatever I was looking at. And so I think I was kind of channeling my own childhood for her. And in a way, the childhood I wish my kids could have because they've, they're growing up in the big city in Chicago. 
and you just can't you can't do it that way here you, <laughs> uh, it's not it's not as safe of a place to to explore or as carefree houseboats on the lake <laughs> is that the next book well it's funny i have a i have a book uh a book kind of roughly outlined that takes place on a houseboat but i'm actually I think it's 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 going to be off a book or two because I, I a few weeks ago I came up with something that I decided I have to I have to write so and it's it's a little bit of a departure. <laughs> Exciting. Do you did you have the tiny mansion sort of percolating in your mind when you started with the Phantom Tower? Did you know that you were kind of bracketing yourself around interesting architecture? I didn't. Um, you know the. I think it started to occur to me while I was working on the Phantom Tower that that would be a fun little theme. Um, it's certainly something that is natural for me. I love, love going on like tours of old mansions and houses. Um, one of my favorite weekends in Chicago is it's called Open House. Um, it's a lot of European cities have this as well where, where um, you know, large buildings and old theaters and some private houses open their doors for tours. And unfortunately, of course, this year it's all virtual because of COVID. Um, but I've just always been fascinated with other people's houses, you know, and I, and I, in, in some ways, I, I think I date it back to being a kid in Missoula. Uh, one of my friends, his family had like the biggest house on the block, but we weren't allowed inside. And I think that really kind of tickled my imagination, often wondering like, what was inside their house? I mean, it was, uh, you know, it turns out that the reason for it was very prosaic. I mean, they, they were embarrassed and they didn't want people inside their house because it was, you know, pretty messy and, and you know, they were kind of borderline hoarders. But that's not my, that wasn't my takeaway at all. Like, I just thought like, oh, there's got to be some cool stuff in there. And, and again, that's, I think that's just a kind of an obsession that stuck with me since childhood. And, and I also think that for kids growing up, you know, when they're very young and you see the, your first visits to other people's homes are when you learn that other people live differently from you. And it's a really, I think it's a very important developmental step. And it sort of sparks the beginning of empathy, really, you know, in, in kids. And so I just think it's a very powerful thing. And of course, it's powerful in one sense. And then in, in my books, it often becomes very wacky because uh, I just exaggerate the homes and, and the structures. But having the big dangerously dilapidated wooden house in the Magistic Castle. I then set the Phantom Tower in an old um, pre-war high rise in Chicago, which is actually the building I live in. I set it in my, my own building because I was learning all these amazing stories about this building. And so that inspired a book. And then I just thought, well, the next one's gotta be another house book, but what do I do? Like I had these big adventures in big buildings and I didn't want to keep repeating myself. So I thought, can I, tell a big adventure with a little structure. And that felt like a challenge that I wanted to accept. Excellent. It reminds me of, um, there's a really great chapter in Ali Brocha, the cartoonist, in her new book um, about the, the first time she realized that people live in the homes that she could see outside her window. Yeah. You know, right. and that that very sort of oh, there's people, like, right. they don't live the same way I do. And, right. um, of course, being Ali Broch, it also takes a very wacky turn. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. I mean, I think there's so many different phases in our lives where we have those moments, right? Like, I mean, you know, there's a the moment when, uh, you know, the, the toddler or the kindergartner or whatever kind of realizes that their family isn't all it is, you know, like that there's, you know, other, other families. I mean, they're, you know, there's just probably, I'm not a brain scientist, but I'm sure that they're like, you know, very specific moments in, in cognitive development where kids just, you know, they move beyond solipsism and realize that they're not the only creature in the world, right? You know, and we have these, these kind of staggered realizations moving forward. And so I, I just think it's a very powerful thing. And, you know, I started thinking too about some of my favorite books, like, you know, one of my favorite middle grade books of all time is Danny Champion of the World where uh, Danny lives with his dad in like, you know, what you wouldn't call now, but what they call then a gypsy caravan, you know, a little wooden trailer, um, which just seemed magical. And, and I think that, you know, uh, the wind in the willows, you know, their burrows and stuff, like lots of kids literature is 
fashioned around where people live because you know home is so important to kids. Uh, but middle grade readers are starting to move beyond that and they're starting to get adventuresome and so they want to, um, you know, they want to explore beyond that and um, you have to kind of challenge them more. They don't necessarily want a tale of just like a cozy little place. I mean, in the tiny mansion, there's not that much action that actually, <laughs> spoiler alert, doesn't, that takes place inside the tiny house because there's not all that much you can do. And the smallness of it kind of drives Dagmar out in a way. Is there, one of my favorite parts of kind of talking about the writing process and where ideas come from are the, the ideas or the facts or whatever that get left behind when we arrive at this final product. Yeah. And, and I feel like Dagmar does have that very adventurous sort of spirit and is also has good reason, as you say, to yeah. um, not be inside the house. And I'm curious if, if there's a little bit of Dagmar that got cut that's lying on the cutting room floor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's interesting. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a strange writer in that um, I don't, cut much. Um, and, and part of this is, and, and I'm not meaning to, I don't say that to in, try to sound self-aggrandizing in any way, but like I was a, you know, freelance writer um, for years. And then I got uh, a job at, at a magazine and worked a book list for nearly 18 years and, um, and was writing books at the same time. And I, I had to hit so many deadlines on a kind of daily, weekly, almost hourly basis. And I had so many writing projects all the time that I kind of tra trained myself to be this, this, you know, and, and for many years, the books, when I would write them, um, I only had an hour a day before work to write and then more time on weekends. And so I, I couldn't be that person who like followed the unproductive lead sort of, and then like wrote it out or whatever. And I know lots of people who do that and then, you know, scrap stuff and, and throw back. So, um, you know, my first couple of books were probably a different story, but I, I eventually kind of trained myself to really only write what I was going to use. But part of that's just planning. Like I, I really, I have the character arc and I, you know, I write towards the end. Like if you have the end in mind and you have, basically I want to know, where the story will end up and I need to know where the, the character will end up. And um, so with Dagmar, I just felt like I was able to, you know, I knew she was gonna be really stubborn. And so I knew her, um, you know, which is one of the great things about her, but I knew that she was going to, and, and then I, you know, gave her a strong foil too. Blake, the, uh, the mean kid that she meets is also stubborn. He's kind of a jerk. She can be a little prickly as well. And um, so it was going to be really, you know, incremental in the way they got together. They were just going to be inching closer to each other. And so kind of each encounter, I just thought like, how can I bring them like this much closer, but without ever having that moment where it's like, oh, I guess we're friends now, right? Because I think ki kids can see through that as well. You know, like they, they don't like that. And they also, I think middle grade readers also don't like the, uh, that kind of pat on the head where, the, okay, and now we're going to underline the theme of this book. Like I tried, I tried to never actually spell that out because I felt like I could smell those out when I was a, a young reader and I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to do that to them either. Well, here's the, the sensitive question. Um, are your favorite readers young readers or <laughs> old readers? <laughs> well, I, you know, I love writing for adults and for young readers. I mean, it, to me, it's just like, I can't really conceive of doing one without the other. And, and I presume I always will write for both audiences. If somebody um, forced me to choose, I might choose middle grade. I think I probably would actually, because, uh, because of the readers. Um, I, you know, the process of writing both, you know, books is, both kinds of books is, is equally pleasurable. I mean, ki kids' books are maybe a little more fun because you get to be just a little more imaginative and a little wackier. But I, you know, I try to be very rigorous with, with both of them. But the difference is when you, when you present your book to the audience, young readers are so open and receptive and they're so enthusiastic. And, 
You know, let's face it, a lot of adults, um, you know, I always make this joke because people always talk about kids as you know, reluctant readers and the problem of reluctant readers. And I'm not saying that's not true. There is, there are real reluctant readers, but I feel the real reluctant readers are often grown-ups who say, oh, I used to read, but then, you know, I just get busy. I get tired from work and I can sympathize with that. But it's so exciting to work with kids and go to schools and, you know, they'll read your book in two days and then say, well, when's your next book coming out? You know, there's just this, this excitement that is so palpable. And it's sort of like adult readers, it's almost like you have to like kind of pull them along with you and like you know, sit them down and like, you know, con convince them to read your book. Um, I'm, I'm grateful, obviously, for anyone who spends the time to read any of my books. But, you know, kids, it's just, it's just a very different thing. And, you know, to be fair, kids are sometimes a captive audience because I'll visit schools <laughs> and, you know, they, they didn't choose to be there, but I, I definitely want to make it um, more than worth their while to, to hear about, you know, my book and to hear about writing. And I try to inspire them to be writers and readers themselves. Fantastic. Well, speaking of the audience and <laughs> folks out there in the world and those readers, um, please again, feel free to drop any questions that you have for Kier in the chat there um, or raise your hand. I'm watching for your hands. Um, so, um, yeah, ping me and I'm happy to allow you to turn your camera on or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so you, while we wait for, oh, here we go. Ariana asks, what kids books and authors do you love? Who are you reading these days? Well, I'm not reading as much middle grade as I should be these days, um, just partly because my, my crazy bifurcated writing life. Um, I've had to read a lot of adult titles for some other projects that I'm working on. And actually, actually, I know I just said I don't do a lot of research, but actually I am about to start writing an adult title for which I will be doing more research than I've ever done. So I'm gearing up for that. But, um, you know, I... Re sort of recently, I dipped into some some classics that I missed the first time around. And um, a, a year ago, I mean, I can't believe I missed, I never read this book. But I never read Harriet the Spy until like a year ago. And I mean, like, oh my God, like Harriet is just like one of the all time great, you know, literary heroines. Um, you know, almost like, uh, like the the narrator of true, uh, true grit, maybe like just in terms of like a voice that you you love and a character you fall in love with. Um, and that was, that was just a great reading experience. And then very recently, actually, uh, so here's another classic. I mean, I do read contemporary middle grade too, but um, I asked a friend of mine who is a middle grade fan, what uh, her favorite all time middle grade book was. And she told me it was a book I had never heard of. It was um, Gone Away Lake. Um, and uh, gosh, I want to get the author's name right. Uh, Enright, I think. And she, and it was perfect because it was like, it was kind of like my, it was a book I would have loved growing up. I mean, I, kids today might not be as captivated by it because it is um, sort of slow moving. It's like written in the fifties. It's, it's a little uh, maybe tra trapped in amber in a way. However, it concerns these kids who discover a dried up lake that's kind of covered with, you know, cattails and things. Uh, and on the shore are these old dilapidated vacation homes that were once owned by rich people who would vacation on this lake. And they meet this eccentric brother and sister who now live it in two of these decaying homes, who then tell the kids, well, you could have a clubhouse in one of the other houses. And I mean, I would have just absolutely loved that. Um, it's a charming book. And as an adult, I really enjoyed it because it's just, um, I was reading it, you know, during pandemic and at a time when I wanted to be escaping Chicago and being outside more and more. And it's, it's evocations of just the natural world are just gorgeous. I'm mean, just, I, I love marshes and I love, I love um, tall grass areas and stuff. And so it was just, it was really dreamy and really actually kind of calming and relaxing. So that was a really wonderful discovery. When I was a kid, uh, my favorite middle grade books were uh, Lloyd Alexander's books, particularly his, uh, the, the Chronicles of, of Predane, um, the, there's five books, um, you know, the Book of Three is the first one, High King, I think, was the one that won the Newbery Medal. Um, that was my 
Um, yeah, that was my Lord of the Rings. That was my Harry Potter series. I just loved it. And I actually recently reread a couple of the books in the series and I thought they still held up really well. So whenever kids ask me, I always push those books because they're still in print and I, I really want kids to discover those. I think they'll still enjoy them. I have definitely found myself rereading a lot more of the juvenile and middle grade books um, because I have, I feel like my attention span is a little shorter. And so it's easier to read a middle grade book, which is far fewer pages than an adult book. Yes. Um, that, I, mean, it, I, it, I find myself recreating that middle grade reading experience too. Yeah. Like I will read the book and I'll just blow through it in one or two days and just be so excited and so engrossed. Yeah. Um, well, and, and yeah, that's absolutely a benefit. And, and one of the things that I kind of miss with some middle grade now, I mean, even mine aren't that short, but like they're, you know, you find these middle grade novels that are 400 pages and I'm not saying some kids don't love to get lost in those books because, because many kids do, of course, but I also feel like there's something about these shorter middle grade books that is also just more accessible to more kids because it's not, you know, there's some kids who are maybe not as, as strong at reading and, you know, a big 400 page book is gonna be a little more daunting, but like Andrew Clements, who's like one of the just classic middle grade authors, I think, um, he just always kind of hewed to that you know, moderate length, the kind of the kind of shorter books that I read when I was growing up, and you could just knock them off in a, in a, in a shorter sitting, which is great for a kid. And as you say, it's great for us, too. I mean, sometimes when I just want a little palate cleanser, I'll, I'll pick something up. Yes, especially right now when I feel like there's just so much information coming to us as we are all captive in our own yeah. tiny home situations. Yes. Um, so, yes. Oh, and the um, tiny mansion. I, uh, there's another classic I read recently, the, the Wolves of Willoughby Chase, which mm -hmm. is such a great book. And then Lois Lowry's The Willoughbys, which is like the, the most hilarious send up of that whole miserable orphan genre. Like those are like, that's a great pairing. Like people should totally read those books together. Well, I, when you said Harriet the Spy, I was like, I bet Dagmar would actually be really good friends. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, and I wish Harriet. I could say that I had read Harriet the Spy I, before I wrote that, but it was just like, um, I, I probably would have had her like be a fan of that book or something. I don't know, like it just like, yeah, I think there's definitely an affinity there. Um, but yeah, she's, she, you know, a book I discovered late, but you know, I, I, I went out, I had a library copy, but I went out and bought a nice hardcover because I just was like, well, this is going on the, on the classics shelf for sure. Fantastic. Um, what are your favorite questions that you get from those young readers? Oh, um, I feel like some, some of their questions are really heartfelt and poignant, and then some of them are just yeah. off the wall. Well, it's so hilarious. Like recently, you know, there's the, there's the classic, um, <laughs> like you see it at, at um, talkbacks after like a film screening. There's always the guy who gets up and says, uh, this is more of a comment than a question. So I did my first <laughs> virtual event recently. And that was literally the first thing one of the kids said afterwards is like, this is more of a comment than a question. <laughs> so you, you never know um, what you're going to get. I mean, some, you know, I'll, I'm frequently asked, how long do the books take to write? You know, what's your favorite book? People always ask, you know, what's the favorite book you've written? Which is really difficult to answer. Um, what, who's your favorite child, Kier? Come on. Yeah, exactly. That's what I always tell them. It's like, you're asking me to choose my favorite child. But I, I do sort of confess that, you know, the most recent book always feels like kind of the favorite because it's the one I'm closest to. And also because I, you know, I hope that I'm improving. I'm trying to get better uh, with every book. And so I certainly feel like I, I was able to accomplish things in the tiny mansion that I wasn't quite capable of a couple of books ago. Um, and I'm fond of them for all different reasons. I mean, you know, the Matchstick Castle is probably the, the funniest book I've, I've written, but I feel like the characters, like the emotional journey in the Phantom Tower is much, much deeper. And then I felt like this book, it was really a nice balance where I was able to have adventure, emotional growth, like, you know, just trying to, to, to get that perfect blend really. Sure. What advice do you like to give, especially to young aspiring writers? Um, or would you give to your younger writing self? Yeah. When well, you were in a, middle grade writing? Oh my I, gosh, I was, I was kind of a nut. Like I was writing all the time. I was already making little books in middle grade. Like I would show people like these little books, like 
I have them handy because when I'm doing school visits, I'm like, you know, here's a little book I wrote and, you know, here's, you know, this one's kind of weird. This one's how like a, a cat causes the end of the, brings about the end of the world. You know, I was a morbid little kid, but. Seems um, legit. But I was, <laughs> yeah, they, if anyone would. Um, so, you know, I, I was always highly motivated. And, and I think that what I would tell, what I do tell young writers really is just like, you know, you, you got to be generous to yourself, write that first draft without a second thought and without a care in the world. However, if you find your own writing is boring you, your, your readers are going to be bored too. So um, you've got to entertain yourself first and foremost. I, I've had, I have an, actually a number of uh, young pen pals that I've picked up over the years. Um, it's, it's amazing because like now I'll do a school visit and then they'll guess my Gmail address because of course you just can. So I ended a school event the other day, I <laughs> got an email to my Gmail from this girl who had these questions and she was a young author and she wanted to exchange ideas as she said, because she said she was feeling really stuck. And I said, well, like send me your story so far. And you know, she was, uh, you know, she was stringing together some exciting stuff. And so I was just kind of, um, you know, for her, I said, a little device I sometimes use if, if I'm feeling a little bit flat is I just say, well, what would be the opposite of what anybody would expect to happen here? What's the exact opposite of the expected action? And can you rationalize it? Like, can you then make it plausible for the book? Um, so I gave her some, some little tips like that. And she seems like she's, she's back at work, but I have, I, there's, I have a few that I hear from, from time to time. And, you know, the other thing I say too, is just like, no matter how much or how little time, try to write at the same time, um, try to write regularly if you can. Um, for me that I, I developed the habit as an adult, but I wish I would have done it sooner. You know, even if it's 10, 15 minutes before you go to school, 10, 20 minutes when you come home from school, right after dinner, whatever just feels right. Um, because I think, I really believe that you can kind of train your brain to be a little more creative at a particular time. Your brain starts to expect, I find it easier to get back into the story I'm already working on because I do it at the same time every day. And we're also creating these cues for ourselves. Like for me, first cup of coffee, first thing in the day, brain is ready and I'm instantly back where I left off yesterday. And I think that that can be very helpful for, for readers too young writers. Fantastic. Well, do we have any other final questions from the audience? Is there something you wish people would ask you more about <laughs> Tiny Mansion? I guess, I guess I wish they would say, can I come visit your school? <laughs> I am, yes. I'm, it's, it's been an interesting time to have a new book out and I am um, you know, so for the foreseeable future, I'm offering free virtual visits to any, any school, any number of kids, just because uh, I'm making those connections with young readers is really, you know, it's important to me as a writer to, to make sure that I'm still um, communicating to them and that I hear their voices and I'm writing the kinds of things that they're going to enjoy. But I also know that, you know, I mean, I, I know it from my pen pals and from, from working with kids that, you know, it can definitely get them excited about uh, you know, about writing their own stories. And, and I, you know, I always tell kids too that, you know, if you want to be a great writer, first, you've got to be a great reader. And so start by reading lots of books, and then your inspiration will follow. Yes. So everyone should start reading <laughs> The Tiny Mansion right away. Um, if you purchased your copy with your registration, uh, those will be mailed to you in the next couple of days. Um, and if not, visit the link in the chat um, to support here. You can get the rest of the books that we talked about today there as well, The Phantom Tower and The Matchstick Castle, so you can have your architecture trio. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Wacky House World. I, I, I've never come up with a good name for it. <laughs> I feel like there, there, there's a fun thesaurus dive there. There we go. Yeah, people feel free to send me suggestions. Yes. <laughs> I'm open to suggestions. If you can guess his Gmail address. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, or cure at curegraph.com also works. <laughs> I'm, I'm findable. <laughs> Yes, you can also follow him and his middle grade books at the Matchstick Castles on Instagram, um, which is a great place to find out more about the tiny mansion and where you might be seeing it next. Um, and also um, to hear more about, there's some great resources there for young readers and teachers. Um, so do check out curegraph.com and 
the Matchstick Castles on Instagram. And Kier, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was or afternoon still. It's what I get for being it's, it's a closed room. Nearly evening where I am. But thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Wonderful conversation. And I just can't wait till the next time I can come back to Country Bookshelf in person. I will I'll it'll be a special day. Well, because of everyone's support purchasing through Books in Common and purchasing books like The Tiny Mansion, we will probably be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm counting on it. I'm counting on it. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's great to spend time with you. Bye, everyone.